Hello, and welcome to the screencast that corresponds to Lesson 1.06 in your workbooks and textbooks. It's over errors in the laboratory and significant figures. I'm Mrs. Willie, and let's get started. So let's first define accuracy. Accuracy is the degree of closeness of a measurement to the actual or true value. So if you are thinking about the darts analogy here, the objective of the game is to have the most points and the bullseye is worth the most points. So as a dart thrower, I want to hit the bullseye. If I am accurate, it means that I have hit the target that I am trying to get in the darts analogy. If we are talking about in the laboratory, like what we're going to be doing in chemistry class, it refers to the closeness of a measured value to a standard or a known value. Standards are what you see in the video in the picture image there. Uh, that's a standard weight value that they are using to calibrate their scale. So in the lab, if you mass a measurement at 3.2 grams, but the actual or known mass was 10 grams, then your measurement is not accurate. And we utilize these calibration weights to make sure that our scale is working properly and functioning within the limits so that it is not the scale that is causing us issues or a source of error and it is what is happening throughout our experimentation or through other random errors which we will talk about in the next few slides. So the other part of accuracy is precision. Uh, precision is also called reproducibility or repeatability. So it's how closely you can obtain the same measurement when repeating the trials over and over again. So if we're going back to our darts analogy here, if they're still trying to hit the bullseye in this example, they are not accurate because they did not hit the bullseye, but they were precise because all four of their throws were close to each other or repeatable. They were, they were repeated with a high degree of certainty. The other way that precision works in the lab is how many decimal places our instrumentation is giving us. So decimal places correspond to the intervals or the lines on our instrumentation. Uh, and so it can vary. I can have a more precise measurement the more places past the decimal that I have. How that works in the lab, like the previous example we used, is that how close two or more measurements are to each other. Hence why your science teachers all these years have had you do at least a minimum of three trials on all of their science experiments, hopefully anyway. So in this example, if that same mass that you utilized earlier uh, was 3.2 and I massed it three di or sorry, five different times, and each time I got 3.2 as the measurement readout, then my scale is very precise in that it was repeatable. Whereas the other side of that precision is the amount of decimal places. So depending on the scale you're using, in your laboratory, you've probably seen some scales that only go to the tenths place and then scales that go to the hundredths or the thousandths place is what you'll see when you're in chemistry or analytical labs going further, farther on from here. So precision is independent of accuracy. So remember, like I said earlier, we wanted to talk about intervals. Uh, that's what tells us the precision of our instruments. So if I'm looking at this, I have two instruments. This one on the left is called a burette. Burettes are different from graduated cylinders in that you are removing the liquid that is inside your burette from the bottom instead of from the top. So the, the liquid is actually coming out the bottom. So when we're reading this, we're still reading from the bottom of the meniscus, but we're going we're gonna to look at how many lines or intervals there are in between the numbers. So 
If I know that I have 28 here and I know that I have 27 here, then I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So there are 10 intervals between the known values. So if this is a 28 and this is a 27, then that means that this is going to be 27.1. We know that, 27.2. Now if we look at our graduated cylinder to the right here, we have the same thing going on, except I have a known value of 20, a known value of 30, then I have one, two, three, four, five. So this must be 25, six, seven, eight, nine. So I also have 10 intervals, but if you notice here, in between these two, you only had one digit. Here, you have a large, we have 10. So we're going from a 0 0.1 measurement to a one millimeter measurement, milliliter measurement. So the instrument on the left is more precise than the instrument on the right because more decimal places. So types of laboratory error. There are two types of laboratory error. The first being systematic or determinant error. This has a definite direction and magnitude, and I can assign the cause. Usually a procedural error, error here, and I can eliminate it most of the time by repeating the trial in question, paying really special attention to that procedure. So systematic error or determinant error has a definable cause, can theoretically be eliminated, and to fix them, you would just redo that trial in your procedure or performance. So an example here would be, I had to fill these pieces of glassware with my sample or maybe one of the substances that I was using in my experiment. And so when I'm doing this and I have to repeat trials, I would have to clean the glassware in between because Procedures in science class cause for clean and dry instruments. Um, we do not want to have whatever was left behind to contaminate something or to add mass that would affect our calculations. The glassware that we were just talking about is uh, precise, more precise than others based off of the numbers of, of intervals there are. So a way to reduce that random. The other type of laboratory error is random or indeterminate error, and it re arises from statistical uncertainties in measurements or from errors that are out of your direct control. So it can be minimized, but it can never be eliminated. So it become, comes from those statistical uncertainties or factors beyond your control. So to fix it, you take more data, which means increasing the number of trials that you perform. So I have a scale in our image over here to the right because have you ever been in the lab and you've seen a fluctuating balance? So the number on the very right decimal is fluctuating up and down. This is due to and caused by airflow in the room. You have no control over airflow in your room. So that would be a random error. Uh, the other one that this is referring to are those statistical uncertainties. Um, we can limit this by choosing the glassware. So if we go back to this previous slide, statistical error is to increase the precision of the instrumentation we are using. Therefore, you never use beakers in class to measure for chemistry. You're always going to use a graduated cylinder or a burette or a volumetric flask, um, something that is at a higher precision than a beaker would give you. So the following are not errors. Your lab partner, people are not errors. Punching calculator buttons wrongly or incorrectly 
writing down data wrong or incorrectly, anything that falls in the area of calculator error or human error are not systematic or random. They are mistakes, but they are not scientific errors. So if I had a scenario where I had to determine systematic or random uh, or a mistake, Mistakes would be these types of examples. So systematic, focusing on procedural errors, random, focusing on things that uh, are beyond your control. So an example would be your lab partner leaves the glassware wet in between trials. So remember, previously we talked about that glassware in our procedures need to be clean and dry in between. And so that's part of our procedure. Though your lab partner did it, I'm sure this was a mistake. They inadvertently left it dry, but because part of the procedure called for having a clean or dry glassware, then we could just redo that trial and say that it was a systemic, and actually that should be systematic error. I need to update that slide. Um, so yes, they made a mistake here, but that was a procedural mistake, not a inadvertent mistake. Percent error. So how we determine the amount of error, systematic or random, is the calculation for percent error. It expresses as a percentage, and that's the difference between the experimental or measured value and the true value, this is usually expressed as an absolute value. So even though you could have theoretically a negative percent error and a positive percent error, for our class, you are going to always express this as an absolute value, which means our percent errors will always be positive. So next we're going to talk about significant figures. I know a lot of you may have a little stress regarding this and have heard this from your friends or upperclassmen that this can be pretty stressful. But this is a large part of chemistry since we deal with measurement and instrumentation for all of the experiments that we do. So we need to understand what significant figures means. And it is the number of digits that are known accurately plus an uncertain digit or the last number in the measurement. So significant does not mean important. It does not, it, it means known. So when we're talking about significant figures, it's how many known values from your measurement do you know and plus one unknown or uncertain digit, not how important the numbers are. So a lot of you have measured using a ruler before, and we're going to use the metric side of the ruler because we are using SI units. So this is in millimeters. So I'm measuring all the way to the tip. Remember, we could determine how many known or certain digits we have by counting the intervals. I know that each one of the lines in between the 18 and the 19 are equal to 0 0.1. So I know with certainty that 18.7 millimeters of this measurement are certain. Then my last, is, last digit is estimated, so it is uncertain. This could vary depending on the person reading the measurement. Hence, where those statistical or random errors are introduced into. So this could be viewed as a systematic and procedural error if the student did not read all the way and report to the uncertain digit, or it could read as a random error because um, two students read that uncertain digit differently, even though that was procedurally correct, that is where I am introducing some uncertainty into my measurement reporting. So all measurements should reflect the uncertainty of the device and order the instrument that you're using to measure to a point. 
which is the number of markings or intervals on that measurement device. So for example, uh, 145 pounds on a scale plus or minus one pound me means that the needle fluctuated by one pound and the five is the uncertain digit. So I can report this with the uncertainty in my first example here, which is that plus or minus and telling me that the uncertain digit is at the ones place. Or you can use significant figures to show that the two in the front are certain and the five is uncertain. But remember, when reporting significant figures, you do all the certain digits and then one uncertain digit. So this would have three significant figures. The bonus about using scales is that your scales give you both the certain and uncertain digit. There is no having to determine that from the glassware and the intervals on the glassware. Unlike with glassware where you have, or a ruler where you have lines and intervals that you have to determine what is certain and what is uncertain. So significant figures are equal to the number of accurately known digits plus one uncertain digit. So 15.06 meters has four sig figs, three certain digits, and one uncertain digit. It applies to measured numbers only, not exact or counting numbers. So if you think back to our last screencast when I talked about the cookie dough recipe and how the one egg was a counting number, not a measured number. So I do not apply significant figures to counting numbers. I only apply them to measured numbers where I need an instrument to find that. So one sheep is an exact number. You know exactly how many sheep there are. Whereas 1.5 meters was a measurement. I needed a tool in order to obtain that number. So it um, entails an uncertainty, uncertainty and the sig fig is required. It reflects, so significant figures reflect the precision of that measuring instrument. So remember the number of markings. Remember I talked about scales. In biology, I could go to the tenths place. In chemistry, I need to go to the hundredths place. If I go up to analytical chemistry or with Mr. Walker in organic chemistry, I'm most likely gonna have to go to the thousandths plate with my measurements. So notice every time I scale becomes more precise. So the more sig figs in a measurement, the more precise that measurement happens to be greatest precision here. A balance can mass 0.01. A sample mass of 54.69 has four significant figures in it. The uncertain digit is the nine. And so that's why we love balances. They give us all of the significant figures that we need to report. We don't have to think about them or analyze the intervals on that instrumentation in order to determine how many significant figures to report. So your final answer must reflect that level of uncertainty present. So when an answer has more numbers than are significant, you need to round. So we'll say we're using that balance in chemistry class to the hundredths place. And there's a number that was given to me to the thousandths place, but I know my balance did not have more precision than that, so I have to round. So any number here would be normal and traditional, so anything less than five rounds down. So 25.01 grams would be what I would report there. In your second example, my ending number is greater than five, so I'm going to round up just like I have all of the years and learned in math when I was in elementary school. And I would report 25.02 grams. All of this being based off of that uncertainty to the hundredths place. Now, chemists do have a slightly tricky rule and it is known as the chemist's rule that 
if I have a reported value that ends in a five or a five and all zeros afterward, then the number before it is going to use the even odd rule. So if I have an odd number here, then I am going to round up. So in this case, it would be 25.02, even though this number is less than a five. Our other example is over here. So if I had 25.025, again, five at the end or five with all zeros repeating at the end because this is an even number, then it remains the same. I do not round up. And when I'm utilizing this rule, zeros count as even numbers. So let's do some practice of reading significant fig figures and reporting them off of what it looks like on glassware. So remember, we always read from the bottom of the meniscus, then I have to count my intervals. So here I have 35, here I have 40, and then I have one, two, three, four. So this is going to have to be 36, 37, 38, 39, and 40. So my certain digits are to the ones place. And so if I were to report this, then this would have to be, and I know my certain digits to the ones, so 36, and then one uncertain digit. So one past that. And so I know this is between 36 and 37, and I'm gonna say 36.5, with this being my uncertain digit because somebody else could read that as 36.4 or 36.6. But I had to have three significant figures because my intervals that I knew were to the ones place and then I had to go one more to the tenths place. What is important here is that you cannot read beyond the capacity of your glassware. So remember we talked about how in the United States, we're using volume as the amount in there and not the capacity or the, the size of that. So in this case, if I had a 10 milliliter graduated cylinder, because there are no lines or intervals above the 10, then the very top measurement on that graduated cylinder can only measure to 10 milliliters, having this be the uncertain digit. So now let's do some practice. I want you to pause the screencast and try and practice these yourselves. I'm going to start with the first one. Um, once you've paused it, then you can come back and see what I got and we can compare values. So in this case, I have a six and a seven. Then I count my intervals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I know that this must be 6.5, that's certain. And then I'm looking here, so I have a 6.6 .6 certainty, and then a zero would be my uncertain digit. Because remember, we're reading from the bottom of that meniscus. So this first piece of glassware would be 6.60, with three significant figures. So this second one, again, is that burette. So it's a little tricky. You're going to read from the top down instead of the bottom up like you would on a graduated cylinder. But your first step is still the same to determine what the intervals are. So you know 28, you know 27, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 intervals. So you know that this is 27.0, 27.1, 27.2, and so on and so forth. So 27.5, 27.6, 27.7, and this would be 27.8. So in between those two, because I'm reading from the bottom of the meniscus, would be 
27.75. And this would have four significant figures in it. And then you have our final example again, back to a graduated cylinder. So 20 and 30. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So you're going by 1 mil increments. Your 1's place is going to be certain. Your 10th's place is going to be uncertain. So this is going to be 24.0, with the 0 being the uncertain digit, and 3 significant figures. Now for the significant figure rules. So the first rule is that all non-zero numbers are always significant. So if you have a reported value, over here to the right, I have four reported values. All four of those reported values have two non-zero numbers, the four and the five. And those are always considered significant. All zeros between non-zero numbers are always significant. So um, these don't have any of those examples over here to the right, but in my example here, I have a zero in between two non-zero numbers. So that zero in between is always significant. So this would have three significant figures in it. Rule number three, all zeros simultaneously to the right of the decimal point and at the end of the number, these are lagging zeros after the decimal are always significant. So it has to have a decimal point, that's important. Because in this example, there is no decimal. In this example, there is. So in this example on the top, I have two significant figures because no decimal is present. So the zeros are not significant. Those lagging zeros are not significant. But in this example, I do have a decimal, and so those zeros to the right, those lagging zeros are significant, and I would report them as significant. Step number four, all zeros on the left of a written decimal point and in a number larger than one are always significant. So in this example, this number is larger than one. So the zero to the left of the decimal point is significant. Uh, this also falls under like rule number two because I have a zero in between non-zero numbers. So for both of those, this makes this zero significant. Where this gets tricky is in this example up here. So you have uh, zeros to the left, and there's a decimal present, but they are to the left. They are leading zeros, so they are not significant. And so you would have two significant figures here because you only have two non-zero numbers. Well, last rule. Leading zeros are ne never significant. So that was that one that we just talked about. So this is last example is the one that gets really tricky because I have zeros that are leading and both that are lagging. It's because the decimal is present. So these leading zeros following this last rule are never significant. So those zeros that are on to the left or at the beginning of the number are not significant. But because there's a decimal point present here, this zero at the end is significant. So I would report three significant figures because remember, precision of the instrumentation. So that's adding us a, a uncertain digit or making our measurement more precise. So adding and subtracting significant figures or sig figs. The, when I'm adding and subtracting, the number that is reported should only contain as many decimal places as the me measurement having the least number of decimal places. That's the important part. So your reported value cannot be more precise than your least precise measurement. So this example is, I have two reported values that I'm adding together. One has one place or is at the tenths place. The other has uh, three places or the thousandths place. So I add them together, lining up the decimals, but I can only report to the 
measurement with the least amount of precision so or least amount of decimal places so my final answer there would be 84.7 i only do this with addition and subtraction so if i look at subtraction as an example i have lots of decimal places to the right in both of those measurements and so i'm going to line them up and then i'm going to report to the one with the least amount of decimal places, this number would have still only three significant figures because those leading zeros are not significant, but I have to write or, or report to four places past the decimal because that is where my measurement value, the one with the least amount of precision gave me. So multiplying and dividing significant figures or sig figs, you go to the least amount of sig figs present. So I have two numbers that I'm multiplying in this first example, 4.36 times 0.00013. I'm going to multiply those and then I would report only to two significant figures. Um, the 0.00013 has all leading zeros, so those are not significant. So the 13 has uh, two significant figures, so it would reported to two significant figures in my final answer. Same thing with division. So if I have uh, 12.300, those zeros to the right are lagging zeros, and there is a decimal present, so they are significant. So there are five significant figures in that top number and then three significant figures in the bottom because the leading zeros are not significant, but the lagging zero is. So my final answer would round to three significant figures. Um, I get a lot of questions about what happens when I'm doing this with exponents. Uh, because you're doing multiplication and division here, and I know you would be adding those exponents. So um, in this case, the lowest number of significant figures and the lowest number of decimal places is going to give you the same answer. Um, I would say just go to the lowest number of significant figures here. So for mixed operations, this is where it gets tricky and I didn't do an example of percent error earlier because I wanted to shape, save it for this final talk here at the end. So you're going to use PEMDAS. Determine the amount of either decimal places or significant digits for each step. Do not round any numbers until you have the final answer. So here's my example. If I'm trying to determine what the atomic mass would be reported to for this compound, uh, I had a subscript of 2. I know the atomic mass to be 1.008 grams, and I'm adding that to 15.99 grams, which is the atomic mass of the other element involved. So I'm going to distribute the 2 and multiply first. So that becomes 2.016, that was multiplication, so you're going by sig figs there. This is a counted number, not a measured number. So I'm going to keep all of my digits, and then I'm adding the two together. Notice I kept this long, I didn't change anything, even though I know that the second reported value only has four sig figs, and this one had five sig figs. Um, because I'm not rounding till the very, very end. So now when I'm doing the addition, it switches from sig figs to decimal places. This uh, first one had three decimal places. The second reported value had two. So my final answer can only be to the two because least precision. Um, so my final answer here would be 18.01. So do not round off until the very, very, very end. You do not want to truncate your number because this would be introducing statistical issues. This would cause you to have uh, more error associated with your numbers than if you have than when you keep them long. 
So finally, our example problem deals with percent error as I talked about in the first part of the screencast. So when you are doing problems, you always show the substitution of your values into the equation uh, before stating the final answer and you're always putting a correct unit after your answer. So the question, an example question would be, you measure the boiling point of ethyl alcohol to be 75.0 degrees Celsius, but the actual boiling point is 80.0 degrees Celsius. So what is the percent error? So I take the true minus the experimental divided by the true. When I do this subtraction, this is decimal places. So both of those would have one decimal place afterwards. So when I subtract the top, I have 5.0 as my reported value. Then I would take five divided by the 80 on the bottom to get 0 0.0625. Remember, I always keep my values long till the very, very, very end. Um, I multiply by 100 because a percent, that's how we create percentages. They are out of a scale of 100. So then I get 6.25%, but then I need to go back and look at each one of my steps. My top was to one decimal place when I did that subtraction. And then uh, when I did the division, now I'm looking at significant figures. This top has two significant figures. This bottom has three significant figures. So my final answer is reported to two significant figures. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you again.